for those of, those of you who don't know me, my name is Goran Juric. Uh, I'm mostly a PHP developer, but I like to play with servers and set up servers. Uh, this is going to be an introductory talk about HA proxy. Uh, I'm not like, I used it in one and a half project, so if you know something, if I say something wrong or you want to add something, please interrupt me. And let's start. So what is actually HA proxy? This is from their website, their tagline. It's a reliable high performance TCP HTTP load balancer. Current stable version is 1.5 that was released in 2014. So what does HProxy actually, actually do? HProxy allows, allows you to distribute the load across several servers to do a payover to backup server if one of your uh, application servers is down or unavailable or you're doing maintenance over it. Uh, it allows you to take the server offline for maintenance. Uh, it can distribute the load using multiple load balancing uh, algorithms like, like uh, round robin or list connections or I don't know, based on your IP address from where you're coming from, it can always take you to the same server. And it also allows you to protect your backend servers. For example, if you know that your application server can handle like 30 or 40 or 50 requests per second, there is no reason to send more than that amount of requests to your backend server. You can just let them pile up on your proxy server or bounce them. So when we say TCP server, uh, TCP load balancer or proxy, that actually means that it can understand everything uh, that's going over the TCP IP protocol on the transport layer. So you can proxy not only websites, but MySQL, uh, Redis, Memcache, any other service that uses TCP IP, you can, uh, you can pass it through hub proxy. Uh, HTTP proxy means that it understands the, the transport, uh, the application layer. Uh, that is coming through the proxy. For example, it understands HTTP and you can, you can use it to inspect uh, cookies, URLs, parameters being posted and act ba based on those, those things. Uh, it also allows you to, we'll, we'll talk about sticky sessions actually a little bit later. So after installation, installation is usually like use your package manager, apt-get install, or yum, or whatever, whatever. Uh, then you have to configure it. It has four main sections. Uh, one is global, default, and these two are the most important ones, frontends and backends. Frontends, this is the place where you define uh, uh, where on which IP address, on which port the hub proxy is going to listen to for incoming connections. And backends is a place where you define uh, all of your destinations where you want to route the traffic to the traffic that came in through the front end. So let's see a simple example. So here we set, we are going to set up uh, one front end. It's going to be called www. And it is going to listen on port 80 and port 443 for HTTPS. We are going to specify a certificate. Uh, this line is automatically going to redirect the client if, it, if he tries to visit the HTTP website, uh, which we don't allow here. And mode HTTP actually tells Hub Proxy that we want, to, want him to understand that we are using HTTP protocol. And we are also going to specify that everything that comes in to, to the front end www is going to be routed to the app server's backend. Uh, app service backend also uses mode HTTP. Uh, well, this actually is not needed here. That's a typo, sorry. Uh, we are also going to tell him to, that we want to add to every request that comes to the www front end, we want to add the x forwarded for header, which is going to contain the visitor's IP address. Uh, we tell them that we want Hub Proxy to check all of our backend servers by doing a GET request on the, this URL. Uh, what this does is actually it allows Hub Proxy to, to check, uh, we define the interval, how often do we want to check the backend servers. We, we can tell them to, to take the server out of the rotation if it's not uh, responding with uh, 200 response on this test URL. Uh, you can see on the right side that we have this rise three 
all three uh, part of the configuration. This actually tells HAP proxy that the server needs to fail three times to be considered uh, down, and it also the, re the check request has to succeed three times to, for the server to be considered as alive. Okay, this is the, this is the really uh, interesting part of the configuration. With, what this does is actually tells HAP proxy, if you see that your application server is setting a cookie, uh, and if you're creating a session in PHP, this is the default name of the cookie that PHP uses. So when HAP proxy sees that your backend server is returning, uh, returning a cookie, it is going to use a prefix method of tracking which server, server returned the cookie. This allows us to use the sticky sessions. For example, if you are visiting a website anonymously and you do not have a session, every time you visit, uh, visit a page, you will probably be routed to one of these servers randomly. You can define here if you want to use it's not defined here, okay, you can say I want to use a round robin algorithm between these two servers. Uh, but the instant you start a session, this session uh, usually contains like session ID and some long string. HA uh, proxy is going to insert, uh, insert uh, in front of this session information the name of the server that served that response. For example, if you started the session on server two, the cookie, actually, you can check it in your browser, will have, before the session, will have server is app, app2. So all other pages that you visit after the session has been set will be routed to the server number two. This allows you a pretty primitive method to, if you're keeping sessions locally on each server, uh, you would log in on one server and on the next request, uh, you would go to another server and you would be logged out again. So this is a mechanism that does it transparently for your application that once you log in, you always end up on the same server. You'll see other methods how this can be also achieved in a little bit smarter way later. Uh, one more thing is that one more thing that Hub Proxy allows you. Just a second. Is to use access control lists. I don't know much about them. I never use them. I just know that a lot of people say it's pretty powerful. Uh, I found two examples that are pretty straightforward where you can see how you can use an access control list to allow only access to the admin and help desk help desk pages if you're coming from one of these two IP addresses. And also, for example, if the path you're visiting ends with slash blog, uh, you will be using another backend server. For example, you can have a separate server that's running WordPress or something else and route the traffic from your domain slash blog to WordPress and every other requests will end on your default servers. Any questions for now? No? Okay. Okay, so if you never use the proxy in front of your application, there are some things that you have to take into account. When, when a visitor visits your website and he comes through, through the proxy, and let's say you have Nginx after that, after your HA proxy, you will not see the client's IP address. You will actually see the IP address of the HA proxy, HA proxy server. So how to deal with this? There are, there are a couple of options depending on what you're using. If you're using an Nginx, Nginx uh, you can use this configuration. It's from a mod called Real IP. I think it's compiled by default. In Nginx, uh, you, can, you can tell him, okay, uh, if, you, if you see a request coming from the HA proxy IP address, you can trust it's uh, X forwarded for header that HA proxy is going to insert into the request. Uh, for Apache, you have mod RPAF, it was used before, and I think this is the new, new thing. I'm not actually following Apache development, but I think this came with 2.4 mod real IP that does something similar to what Nginx does. Also, since the HA proxy is adding headers, uh, anybody can add headers to their HTTP request, and you don't want somebody to override some of your security features of your application by trusting any header you receive. So for example, if, you, if you're using a Symfony framework, there is a configuration option where you tell him, okay, only if the request, come, request comes from the HProxy 
IP, then you can trust that the last last X forwarded for header is actually the correct one. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah of course. Uh, yes, so when you're using X forwarded for, um, the method is that every reverse proxy in order, like if we have more than one, yeah. it will add another IP. So the best thing is not to use the real IP header for engine X, but use another uh, X um, header, like X real IP. And then mm -hmm. you set the AJ proxy, and then you have uh, the uh, uh, header set on AJ proxy, which will uh, be uh, Different. unique, uh, unique uh, all the way down. And X four four is just another proxy will have. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Piece, yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you. Uh, Okay, I missed this slide. Uh, when I started playing with HE proxy, there's not much information on the internet if you compare it to Nginx or Apache. So if you want to set up SSL, you can use this nice site. It has also configuration options for Apache and Squid and Nginx, and I think that's about it. Okay, so that's that's one part of the the equation, the other part is the, we haven't talked about, is high availability of the, of the HA proxy server. So how, the, how is this use usually handled is that you have one or more servers that each, ex, that use a floating IP address. Uh, let me explain a little bit better what is a floating IP address. Let's say that you have two, two servers and the provider, your hosting provider, he has to support this, of course. He gave you one IP address that isn't uh, located on any of these servers, but it's floated between two of them. There, there are more software that can do this. Some of them are keep alive there. That's what I use on Tomislav's advice. Uh, also, Heartbeat, Pacemaker, uh, those are like synchronization softwares that take care that in each moment in time, at least one of these servers has this public, I, this floating IP binded on their interface. So, for example, if this, this server, uh, Load Balancer 1, is uh, active, he has the public IP address that people are using to access your website or your service. And he communicates with the uh, second load balancer the whole time. And if the second load balancer notices that this one went down, he's going to take the, the floating IP address and your service will resolve working as usually. Of course, the, the configuration for HA proxy is the same on both sides, so they can load balance the traffic on your application servers. Yeah. Uh, what is the communication between LB1 and LB2, for example? Uh, they're using VRPP protocol if you're using uh, Keep Alive there, I'm, I think. So you have to open some ports on, on those two servers. I'm, okay, but what if it's split? Uh, well, it actually doesn't matter if both take the, this IP address. The request is going to be routed to one of them. I mean, this is not the same situation, for example, if you have a, a database and you're worrying about split brain. You don't actually care which one of these servers gets the request. It can happen, but it should work in most of the cases. Yeah? Uh, okay, so why don't, why don't you utilize uh, both or four, five, six H proxies at the same time? Uh, I don't know, it depends. I mean, uh, probably there's some overhead if you're doing it with more services. You can add more than two. This is just an yeah, example. Which, what? Uh, but with network player. So you configure it on the router, router protocol switches, and use uh, four proxies at the same time to add down uh, to share the load. Okay. We're forgetting that not all people uh, control their own. Uh, yeah. And you don't know, need to in the new study with uh, static routes with the uh, HRP and the uh, Okay. Yeah. You think you want to move the load balancer part further up the network chain, right? Or? Uh, just the floating IP. So uh, you, you use uh, routers or where the switches uh, to distribute the sessions. Yeah, if you have access to that part of your equipment, great. I mean, you have to remember that we are talking about most of us are developers having access to some servers in some data center. We don't actually do that stuff. That's probably more your work than ours. But I get what you're getting at. Anything else? Okay. 
So, I mentioned before that you can, uh, you can stick the user once he creates a session to one of the servers, but if that server that he is connecting to goes down for some reason, you have a problem because the user is going to get logged out when he visits another server. Uh, that, that is only if you're using the default configuration where every server keeps the sessions on their own file system or their own memory. So what people are doing, they are actually doing one of those, these two things. They either use, uh, either use a cluster session storage uh, that can go through HA proxy again in the TCP mode. For example, you can have a Redis cluster where you store all the session information and let the hub proxy deal with which one of these cluster servers is online. And another option that is pretty complicated is to not use sessions at all to just encode and sign the messages that you want to, for example, like flash messages or who is logged in to just store this information in the cookie. Uh, I haven't tried it. I wouldn't recommend it here. Yeah. Uh, if you don't use sessions and uh, you give them out to cookies, that's an enormous security. Because you should never, ever trust a client to supply. Yeah, but you trust the client to supply the session ID, right? Uh, yeah, it's not the same. You're not going to store the user's password or his, his admin flag is not going to be stored in the cookie, of course. But the, the, what's the user's ID or some, some of his hash or something like that, it's actually not that different than using the session ID. So if you can guess the session ID, you can log in as the user that is using the session, right? So it's the same if you can guess the, the, cookie. the cookie. Yeah. So then, we can discuss that later, can discuss that later over there. I, I understand what you're saying, but actually it's not different than using or guessing the session ID. Uh, okay, so the other option is not to use sessions. Also, uh, not using sessions? No. On some scale? No. I, I've been reading about it, but yeah, I found one project that's working on it currently, but it's in an alpha state. Uh, I can share the link with you later. <laughs> uh, also, uh, when we are talking about high availability in your application, uh, if you have only one database that's also a single point of failure, it makes doesn't make much sense to have a high availability load balancer and application server if your database is single point of failure. Uh, again, you can use HA proxy to connect your database if you're running like a Percona cluster behind it or a, or master master application or something like that. Also, one thing to to take into account uh, when you're deploying your application if, if it involves restarting services, it's pretty nice to have what's called like rolling deployments where you don't restart all the application servers at one, but like take it out of the load balancer, restart it, and then continue until you do you're done with all of the application servers. One nice thing about the HE proxy is this web interface. Uh, where you can read all sorts of uh, statuses and statistics. The part I like is it's not shown here. You can set a, a flag that you can administer the server through the web interface. For example, you can decide, okay, I want this server now to go online or change its status to maintenance so I can do something manually on it and stuff like that. Also, if you, you connect to the server, there's a nice utility called HATOP that actually displays of probably the same information you see on the web interface. Okay, and this is the last slide. I had some troubles doing this slide because later I found out that some of these options are, yeah, and actually some were backported to the open source version in late last two or three months. But uh, if Nginx, Nginx works for you, great. Uh, I personally like the idea of being able to, to not restart the server by, I, I would like to go to web interface and pull out some of the servers out of the rotation, do some stuff on them, test things out and then bring them back on. And I wasn't sure how I would do that in Nginx. But what are the main differences, at least they were before, Nginx was in HTTP and 
IMAP and POP3 balancer didn't understand plain TCP. Uh, also, Nginx had to get uh, 500 response from your backend server to consider that server being down and each proxy does the checks uh, regardless if you're having some traffic coming through or not. Of course, the uh, admin interface I mentioned and again, I wouldn't like to talk much about this because I have no, no experience, but if, they, if everybody say they're powerful, they probably are. So, that's about it. Any questions?